Welcome everybody. We are pleased that you've joined us wherever you've found us, whether you're a regular attender or whether you've just come across our website. We are pleased that you're with us here today. As we start our worship service, let's start with a call to worship. These are a few words out of Psalm 145. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them food in the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living being. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today because you are gracious, compassionate and rich in love. You are trustworthy and faithful, strengthening the weak and providing the needs for the poor. Open your hand, Lord, and fill us with your presence as we sing praise to your name. May your name be glorified by the words of our mouths and the work of our hands. Let us join together and sing praise to the Lord. Praise his name forever.
We have a couple of announcements for you today. Those announcements firstly deal with the AGM. You know that in the past, because of coronavirus, we've had a few issues with scheduling the meeting for our annual general meeting. Uh, Hudson has some more information for you about that. Hello church, it's Hudson Lunn here, chairperson of the board. I'm just letting you know and giving you the two weeks notice from today that we are having our AGM for 2020 on June 28th. Now, before you get too excited, it's still not possible to properly meet in person with the current COVID-19 restrictions in place. Hence, there will not be an actual meeting at the church, nor will there be a virtual live online meeting. Instead, if you are a member, you will be receiving an email from us with the agenda and information booklet attached and a link in the email for you to be able to vote online. Uh, if we don't have your email address, you will receive a post out with exactly the same information and a voting form. So, how's this going to work? You will be deemed to be at the meeting if, at your own leisure, you have read the information, which is set out exactly as if we were having the meeting in person, and you read the motions put before you, you can then follow the link in the email and vote at any time that suits you. We will close the voting at 5pm on Friday the 3rd of July after which the scrutineers will check the voting and advise us all of the outcome. The motions that we need to vote on are accepting the minutes from the previous AGM in 2019, accepting the financial figures for 2019, reappointing the auditors for 2020, and best of all, to vote in two new proposed board members in Jake Breitenbach and Simon Wong. So there you go, church. AGM 2020, from the comfort of your own home and at your leisure. Oh, P.S. If you have any queries, simply reply to the email or call the church office. Don't forget to vote. The other announcement that we have to bring to you is that there's some activity at our church building at the moment. The college students have returned and the cafe staff have returned. There's some activity, some noise about the place, and we're really pleased about that. This is what a return to college looks like. Just before Peter comes and brings the message for us today, let's offer up our prayers of intercession before the Lord. Will you join with me as we pray? O oh God, our Father, we come before you today with prayers of intercession 
for our world and for our loved ones. We pray for our world, Lord. There are many reports of strife, riots and troubles. Our news services are filled with stories of confusion and chaos. Our prayer today, Lord, is that your peace and your order will be restored in our world. We pray this for we are confident that you are the God who brings peace. O oh Lord, would you be pleased to grant peace to our troubled world? Where there is injustice, we pray that your word will be heard, asking that righteousness will be restored in our land. We pray for the poor. May they receive provision direct from your strong right hand. And we pray for the widow and the orphan, asking that they will find protection in your care. We pray for the hungry and the homeless, asking that they may find shelter in your provision. And we remember those with failing health. Lord, have mercy upon our brothers and sisters. Grant them the peace which comes from assurance of your presence in the midst of their suffering. You are the God who carries the weak. We pray also, Lord, that you will speak clearly this day. Take the work of preparation and the words of your servant Peter and turn them into truly life-giving words, words that bring much needed nourishment to our souls. May our ears be ready to hear from you and our hearts be warmed by the clarity of truth that comes to us. May God, who brings us peace, remind us yet again that you are for us and not against us. Remind us yet again, Lord, that you have called us your own. We pray all of these things today, Lord, in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. Hi, and welcome to Sunday at Home. We continue in our series, and this morning I want to share with you thoughts on thinking. What is our thinking process? Well, if you remember, in the late 1980s, we had this computer revolution that began. And there was this new phrase that was coined because some people put certain things in a computer and they expected something different. And hence, the phrase that was coined was G-I-G-O, or GIGO, or some said GIGO, garbage in, garbage out, or junk in, junk out. And so we know that that's how the human mind operates. Although we read in the scriptures that we are weird and wonderfully made by God, still in our mother's womb, he formed us. But we have certain traits and characteristics like a computer. Had a look at how many thoughts we think a day. It's between 60 and 80,000 thoughts a day. So an average of about 70,000 thoughts that come across our mind. That's between two and a half and 3,000 thoughts per hour. It's incredible. And so how do we organize this thought process when so many thoughts come across our mind? Well, it's in the millions of thoughts that come across our mind in a year. And in each of these, we have choices to make. It's amazing if somebody were to give us X amount of money, we would think about how to spend that money. Assuming I gave you 70000 dollars and I said to you how would you spend it and you have to spend them all that money in one day you'd say well I think about it very very carefully well assuming we have about 70,000 thoughts a day how would we spend these thoughts we devote so much time and effort to calculating how we're going to spend our money but so little time on how we spend our thoughts Ralph Waldo Emerson said, beware of what you set your mind on because that you surely will become. 
Norman Vincent Peale said, change your thoughts and you change the world. Henry Ford gave the truth a different spin and he said, thinking is the hardest work in the world, which is probably why so few people engage in it effectively. Then Betty Sicelli said, two thoughts cannot occupy the mind at the same time. So the choice is ours whether or not our thoughts will be constructive or destructive. And so we have choices to make with reference to our thoughts in our lives. Choices that will build people up, choices that will break people down through the things that we think and eventually say. Thoughts that are constructive or often destructive. I am very aware uh, that I have a son and often he follows what I say and what I do because of what I'm thinking. One year he gave me th my, this cooler bag. It says, my dad, my hero. And I try and have a life that's pleasing to God so my son will follow that. But there are certain things that come out of my thoughts and out of my mouth in the traffic. And they're not always positive and constructive thoughts. So I have a choice to make because when my son says something that is not good, where does he get that from? And so we have choices to make. Am I my son's hero or am I just another loser in his life that models something that is destructive? Well, in Philippians chapter 4, verse in, verses 8 and 9, Paul writes to us and he says um, something very profound with reference to our thinking. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Let's have a look at what I've put on the whiteboard to try and explain this passage. Well, Paul is writing and he says that Finally, he said that in the previous chapter, but I think he's saying finally, finally now, whatever is true and noble and right, pure and lovely and admirable, if anything is excellent or, or praiseworthy, he's saying think on these things. The word that he uses for think there is the Greek word logizome, which means to count, calculate or add to account. In other words, what would it be that we would want to add to our account? Hopefully nothing negative or destructive, but things that are positive and constructive. And so he's saying, logizome, present tense, this is what you should be thinking. And he gives us a list of these things. Now, I think Paul would have known Jesus' teaching in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, where Jesus says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In other words, G-I-G-O or J-I-G-O, junk in will result in junk out. And so Jesus taught about that. And Paul is reminding us in the present tense saying, this is what your thought pattern should be about. And it gives us that list of what we should be meditating and thinking about now and going forward. You see, the, ma the mind is very, very powerful because it's, it's the Greek word psyche, which means our psyche and our thought pattern. And so that's how we function as human beings. And as we look at, at what the mind does, that's what we will meditate upon. In Matthew chapter 5, we know Jesus teaches about anger and murder. And he says, well, you know about these things because if you have, if you commit uh, or kill somebody, it's murder. But Jesus says, even if you have anger in your heart, 
In other words, that's what you're meditating on and taking it to its nth degree and to its conclusion, it will end up in murder. And that's what Jesus is saying. He says exactly the same about lust and looking at a woman with lust in your eyes. It's not saying, well, I look at it and it's beautiful. No, it's meditating. It's getting the psyche so addicted to that, that it becomes a problem and ends up in sin. Greed with money and all the other things, when we begin to meditate on these negative sins, S-I-N-S, so we will end up doing them. No wonder Paul says, meditate. Think about these things that are, are good for your life. And so I want to take a few of these thoughts and just explain them to us as we go through them. The first one is the word true, true. Paul says, whatever is true, it's a Greek word, alithis, alithis. And what he's saying is, uh, all things that ring true. In other words, when it sounds true, then it's good. If it's untrue or unreliable or dishonest, be careful of that because it is dangerous. The word lethos is where we get the English word lethal. It could be a stone, could be a weapon, something that is dangerous. But he's putting a little A in front of that. Alithis. In other words, something that is good. Whatever is true and not dangerous, as it were, is what Paul is saying. Things that ring true, focus on them, think on them. Secondly, whatever is uh, honest, honest or noble, uh, something that is worthy of reverence. And the word reverence is a word that means deep respect. My mom used to say, you must be semnos. You must be honest. You must have deep reverence for the things that matter. There must be this majestic and awe-inspiring thinking pattern in your life because that's what will come out. In fact, that's one of the characteristics of an elder in the Bible. Uh, a thought life that is honorable. It's not frivolous and trivial and focuses on things that are not good, but things that are honest is what Paul is reminding us on, to take them in because that's what will come out. Thirdly, he says things that are right. And the word right means uh, just. Things that are, are conforming to God's standard. You see, they might be right in my eyes, they might be right in somebody else's eyes, but they could still be wrong. But the question I need to ask myself, uh, and what Paul reminds us of, things that are right, in other words, right in God's eyes. Are they right in God's eyes? Because that's the standard. He also says things that are pure. In other words, um, agnos is the word there, things that are undefiled, uh, things that are clean and holy. He's talking about moral purity here. Things that are, are good for us. We often say, well, a penny for your thoughts. Hmm, I wish I knew what you're thinking about right now. Well, scary stuff because there's a challenge. Because my mind could be in the gutter. I need to take my mind out of that gutter, is what Paul is saying, and begin to morally think or think moral pure things that will be uplifting rather than bad. That organization, Promise Keepers, uh, has a beautiful brochure, and I started reading uh, that brochure, and it asks certain questions about me as a man. Questions like, have I been with a woman in the past week in a way that could appear compromising? Or what about my financial dealings? Have they been filled with integrity? Or are they a little bit impure, unholy, if you like? Have I uh, viewed any sexually explicit material, things that are bad, that are, are from the gutter, from the pit of hell, if you like? Things that um, I spend my time on. Is my time spent on things that are pure? Because if they're not, guess what will come out of the mouth? And so, have I lied to anybody? Have I allowed myself to be tarnished with anything bad? 
And so Paul challenges us here and he says, think about things that are, are pure, agnos, things that are uh, clean and holy and undefiled. He also says that we need to focus on things that are lovely. And this word lovely is the only time it appears in the New Testament. Prosphilis is the Greek word there. It means pros towards and phileo, love. Prosphilis. In other words, do I attract people with my character and my life? Well, if I'm putting bad thoughts in, so bad thoughts will come out. But if good things are going in, well, good needs to come out and I will be an attraction. Like a magnet and iron filings. Those iron filings are attracted to that magnet. I wonder how many people enjoy my company. I wonder how many people go, oh, there he comes. Let's go across the road. Am I attractive? Am I lovely? Am I speaking things that are life-giving? Or am I breaking people down? Paul says, think on things that are lovely. He also says things that are admirable. And it's interesting uh, what this word means because it's got to do with good, good thoughts and, and things that are not cheap and crude. He, he's talking about things that are positive and not negative, things that are constructive rather than destructive, things that uh, break up rather than tear down. If I were to spend time with people, do I build them up? Or do I actually break them down? Do I give them life through the words that I speak? Or do I actually uh, leave a stench behind in their lives? These are challenges that Paul places be before us because it's our thought pattern that will lead us to action. In Ephesians 5.12, Paul talks about some of the things that we keep in secret. And he mentions uh, sexual sins and, and gross forms of idolatry because they're all part of Satan's kingdom. And he says, be careful of that. Be careful of that. Another thought I want to leave with you is perhaps a question. I grew up and uh, when we did something silly, somebody would say, how's your mind? How's your pip? <laughs> in other words, what are you thinking about? Well, Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know, brings us back to where we started in the beginning on our thoughts. What, what Paul tells us to think about. You know, these things that are right. So how is my mind in all of this? And so Paul is saying, make sure that it is right. And, and, not, and so Proverbs, we read part of the wisdom literature here, for as he thinketh, as a person thinks. That word um, thinketh is the Hebrew word shavar, which means what we open our hearts to. It's like an open or closed gate. It's like a pot when you take the lid off and put good or bad in it. You can't put junk into a pot and expect a beautiful cake to come out. Well, friends, what do we open our hearts to? Because that word heart has got to do with our appetite. Um, what do we take pleasure in? Because whatever we take pleasure in, that's where we will open our heart. And what we open our heart to is what we will take pleasure in. In other words, you cannot separate the heart and how we think. So what we're putting in is what will come out. You see, that's what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 to 26. He says you don't kill, but you know what? It starts off with your thoughts on anger. You do not, want to, you do not commit adultery, the law says, but instead you have lust. And so that lust, if you meditate and think upon it, that's exactly what he's talking about. As you meditate and think upon it, so it will come out in your actions. And so what you think today, you become tomorrow. And so the, the mind is the best predicator of what the future has in store for us. And I'm not talking pop psychology. Wake up, look in the mirror and say, yes, yes, yes. No, it's got nothing to do with that. It's to take in what is the standard of God, because that's what will come out. You see, if I think angry thoughts, angry words will come out of my mouth. If I have sexual fantasies, well, my body will find a way to fulfill those desires. 
If I dwell on problems, soon I will be overwhelmed. If I feel like a victim, I will eventually become one because that's what my thought pattern is all about. If I expect defeat, I'll probably lose because I've probably lost already. And so if I dwell on rejection, then I set myself up for more rejection. So is there anything positive in all of this? Well, Paul says, focus on the truth. Why? Because then you'll speak the truth. Focus on honest things, he's saying, because honesty will mark my life. He says that I must seek out lovely things uh, because my life will be attractive and lovely to others. Dwell on that which is right, he's saying, because wrong will not have any attraction in that case. Think on things that are pure, he says, because that's when we become pure and excellent. You know, things that are of positive character and virtue. Why? If we look for them, we will find them. He says, things for, seek for things that are of a higher spiritual level, because then we elevate our lives. Logizome, meditate on them, calculate them. Things that are good for us rather than bad. Well, friends, a lot of us want to go and smell and see what a pigsty looks like. In fact, we want to get into the pigsty to see what it smells and feels like. And then we want to come out smelling beautiful. Well, friends, we know the story. You mingle with the pigs, you'll smell like a pig as well. And so we need to do our very best to stay away from these things that will corrupt us. These things that will defile us. And that's why Paul says, listen, there's got to be things that are excellent, that moral goodness, that purity. Uh, so when other, look, other people look at us, they will approve. But more importantly, God needs to approve. Think on these things, he's saying. Focus on those things. And friends, it's interesting to, to note that as we focus on those things, earlier on, in the previous chapter, he says, the peace of God that passes all understanding will be with us. But in this particular case, he says, the God of peace. And if you look at the original, it actually says, the God who gives peace. The God who gives peace. And so, how can I have a healthy mind so I can understand that God will be with me? Because that's a promise that is given. Well, I think firstly, we need to examine what goes in. The music we listen to, the movies uh, we watch, uh, all the things that we take in, the books that we read, uh, the radio stations and the music that we listen to, the conversations that we have, uh, the phone calls that we make, the, the, the junk that we read on iPhones and the junk that we send out on our iPhones, you know, the places we go to, these secret habits. Be careful, examine your life because it's extremely dangerous. In fact, Paul actually tells the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, that there is a war taking place. He says, take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That word take captive, echmalotizo, to, to take it with a spear into captivity so you can drive the enemy out. Why? Because anybody who does not want to submit, obedient is there, to, to comply to the things of the kingdom of God needs to be driven out with a spear. There's a war going on. You know, it's not enough to just listen to a sermon or watch a church service less than an hour a week and expect to live a life that's pleasing to God when we spend 40 hours a week on junk. We need to be focusing uh, on the things that are right and examine the stuff that goes in, what goes in. But also, secondly, we need to get rid of anything that is not good. We know that. That, that should be um, common sense. Anything that is bad for me, I need to decide to change. Now, friends, I'm not thinking that it's easy. But I can be accountable to somebody and I can ask somebody to walk the road with me. Find a friend. Be accountable to a friend. And say, listen, help me here. Pray to God. Not by might nor by power, but His Holy Spirit will help us. And as we make ourselves part of the community, so we can be accountable 
to somebody and to one another. Thirdly, to quote my mother, show me your friends and I'll tell you your worth. Show me your friends and I'll tell you your worth. Paul writing to uh, the Corinthian church there in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 33 says, bad company corrupts good character. That's the King James Version. Bad company corrupts good character. What he's actually saying there, bad company omelia, omelia, bad words, bad communication, bad companionship is what he's saying. Corrupts, that word corrupts, uh, uh, it breaks it down and throws it over. It defiles, it destroys good character. It destroys good character. I remember when we were in the army, mingling with all our army mates, there was bad language that was used most of the time. When I'd come home for the weekend pass to be with my family, that Friday afternoon, bad words would come out my mouth because that's what I was taking in all the time. It's amazing <laughs> uh, the adjectives we use to describe a door. It's got to be a something door, you know, or a car, or, you know, it's weird. And then over the weekend, not swearing at home, I'd go back to the army base on Monday and it would be good language by, by the weekend, same story. So I need to make sure that I'm mingling with the right people because that's important. If I love parting, I need to make sure that I get rid of some of that stuff and the people I party with. You see, the people can influence me positively or negatively. If I'm uh, mixing with people who drink and get drunk all the time, well, it's not a good reflection because um, the language that will come out of their mouth won't be good all the time and I will be influenced by that. And so let's be careful who we mingle with. Are we influencing others or are they influencing us? Also think that we need to take in the Bible. We need to meditate on the scriptures. Paul writes in Ephesians 5.18, he says, Do not get drunk on wine that leads to debauchery. In other words, uh, things that you will take in will come out. But be filled with the Spirit, present and continuous. Be being filled with the Spirit. What's the outcome of that? Well, you'll speak to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. You'll speak to one another through the Scriptures, because that's what will be coming out of our mouths. There's a spiritual warfare taking place. We need to make sure that we discipline ourselves so we do the right uh, input in our lives. And then I want to end off by telling you how profound this passage is because Paul says that all these things here, this, as we do all these characteristics of what we need to think on, the God of peace or the God who gives peace, and friends, that's found through the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross of Calvary. And so if you go back to all of, all of these characteristics, that's what we meditate on and that's what we think. And they're all found in Jesus. They are all found in Jesus. And Paul would have known this as he writes to you and to me. So as I was beginning to, to exegete this passage, I began to realize that, that what Paul was saying is exactly who Jesus is. No wonder he's able to relate it to Jesus' teaching. And that's what Paul says. And so he says um, back to Jesus, the person of, of who Jesus Christ is, that he is truth. He is the most noble son of God. He is the standard of our righteousness. And Paul was saying, uh, whatever is true and noble and honest and righteous, that's who Jesus is. Whatever is pure, because he is the fountain of purity. Whatever is lovely, he's saying, he's the altogether lovely one, the Bible says. Things that are of admirable report, he's the admirable saviour. No one can compare to Jesus. Things that are, are of excellent value, of, of, of good virtue, that's Jesus. And the one that is praiseful that we are to think about is Jesus. He is the praiseworthy one that we are to adore and give glory and honor to all the time. Well, if we are linked to him, then our thoughts 
will come from him. But if we are linked to something outside of who Jesus is, that is dangerous. So as we link ourselves to him, we joined with the highest moral power in the universe. And that's what Paul is encouraging us to do. It's not this abstract philosophy that he's talking about. No, it's a reality. It's a call to a personal relationship with Jesus and to be linked to him. The question I ask myself, who am I linking with? And who are you linking with? Well, friends, if you had one more phone call to make in absolute desperation, who would you call? Somebody that is filled with these particular characteristics? Thing, a person that is true, noble, and right, and pure, and all these wonderful characteristics because their life is found in Jesus, or would you call somebody else? And then the major challenge comes, how many phone calls would you and I receive? How many would we receive? So my hope, my prayer, is that as we link to Jesus, so we will think and meditate on the things that are focused on Jesus and we will be attractive to the world. Wow, what a challenge. Let's pray together. Our Father, what Paul challenges us with today is not easy. And so we submit to you, Lord, and we ask you for help that we might be able to meditate and think and get our thoughts pattern right. To focus on you, Lord Jesus, and on you alone. Help us to do this, Lord, we pray. So you will get your fame, your honor, your glory from our lives. And Lord, people will be attracted to us. And we will say, it's because of Jesus. Help us to do this, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.
As our service draws to a close, let me remind you that next week, Jonathan Anthony will be bringing the message and his message will be titled, Loving in Uncertain Times. Our service has ended. We trust that you have enjoyed it and we are looking forward to the time when we can all be together again. In the meantime, let me pray for you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and may he walk with you all the days of your lives. Amen. Amen.